Hello and welcome. Thanks everybody who's shown up today for our Ask an Angler Walleye and Sawgye fishing tips. So today we're going to go over kind of species profile of walleye and sawgye, um, where to look for them, uh, you know, what are some of our better fisheries around the state for catching them, uh, and then what bait and lures you're you're looking to use. Um, Walleye and sawgye, for all intents and purposes, can be considered a more difficult fish to catch, um, you know, throughout the year. But March and April, um, and then again in October and early November, uh, it they get easier to catch because they end up in parts of the water column where they're more accessible from boat and bank anglers. So. Uh, we're going to go over and try to help you guys get on to uh, some walleye and sawgye this year. So as of right now, today, um, today is the full moon of March. Uh, our walleye around the state are going to be in their spawning routines, which means they are going to be up either in feeding tributaries, so in flowing rivers and creeks, uh, as well as up on the dam, uh, riprap areas, spawning habitat in bodies of water that might not have inflow or the walleye prefer to spawn um, in those types of areas. So uh, we'll go through um, kind of the different lure selections that you have. But, you know, this time of year, uh, there's certain places um, that have the walleye and sawgye in them. And you're really looking to target the shallow water, um, especially in the overnight hours. So uh, walleye, the way that their eyes are built, um, they have they like to stay in kind of darker water. They're very light sensitive. So typically um, they're caught in deep water where there's not a lot of light penetration. So when you're catching them during the daylight hours, you're typically catching them out in deeper water um, where light's not penetrating down to the bottom. Um, and they move into the shallow water, not only to spawn, um, but during full moons because it's dark outside, but they get that light up top um, and they get really active uh, in the you know, dusk hours all the way into the dawn hours, especially during the spawn right now. Um, so you're going to have fish moving up and out uh, pretty much daily for the next several weeks, if not a couple of months, depending on what body of water you're on. Um, some of our main walleye fisheries, uh, Altus Luger, Canton, um, Western Oklahoma, uh, is seen as kind of our, our walleye sawgye habitat, but we have walleye and sawgye mixed out throughout the state. Broken Bow has some really, really quality fish in it. Um, and you can get into them right now with the white bass run up in the mountain fork river. Those fish will push up into the shoals and the narrows where bank access, uh, is to be had from anglers. So you get the opportunity to go get into some big walleye. We'll just fishing from fishing from the bank. Uh, so that makes it pretty easy. Um, but our sawgye, we, we produce sawgye, uh, for the state. So a sawgye is a combination between a, uh, most, most of the time we're looking for a female walleye and a male sauger. So walleye and sawgye are not a native fish. So walleye aren't native to Oklahoma, but sauger are, and they're in the Arkansas river. So what we look to do is take the genetics of a walleye, which we want the growth rate. Um, so walleye can grow over 30 inches, whereas a sauger, a big sauger is 20 inches. So, uh, what we get is the, uh, genetics from the sauger so that they can handle kind of the warmer water temperatures, um, adapt them better to an Oklahoma climate, but then have the growth rate of a walleye. So sawgye do pretty well here um, in uh, in Oklahoma, just because we're able to get that nice cross and we have a native fish here in the sauger that, sur that supplies half of those genetics. So in most bodies of water of the state, we really have moved towards stocking sawgye as opposed to walleye. Um, walleye can naturally reproduce. So the idea in, in that is that where we have walleye, they're kind of a self-sustained fishery where a sawgye, like most hybrid fish, do not typically reproduce. They are sterile, um, but they do go through the same routine in attempting to spawn as their um, two genetic parents. So this is the time of year that sawgye are also pushing up to look to spawn, um, even though they don't physically reproduce. So 
you know, if you're, if you live in central Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, Southern Oklahoma, you got lots of good bodies of water, the Southwestern part of the state, our Southwest fisheries crew, they do a great job of, um, sog eye management. So, um, there's lots of smaller lakes, uh, more accessible lakes from the bank in the Southwestern part of the state. You have Duncan Lake, uh, Clear Creek Lake, hum Lake Humphreys, Ellsworth, uh, uh, what do we got down there? Fort Cobb, Altus Luger. Um, those are all great walleye and sawgye fisheries. Ellsworth, especially, you can catch some big ones below the uh, dam when they're releasing water in that tail water. That's a really good spot to go to find some pretty decent size uh, sawgye. And just like any body of water where you have a big, uh, you know, tail water that comes down into either a feeder creek or a, or a major tributary um, below the dam you get a lot of walleye and sawgye uh, catch, especially when they're generating water. So those are always good places to look. But right now at this time of year, what you're looking for is wind driven banks that have gravel, rock, hard bottom. Um, what walleye and sawgye are looking for is an area that they have current that's pushing into their eggs. Um, if they're not spawning up in a Creek where they have moving current, because what happens is that wind gets pushed in to those gravel and rocky areas and it creates re rebound current. So those eggs stay aerated. So that's kind of what they're looking for. So, you know, right now I would be, I'd be fishing on the dams at all of our major reservoirs that have walleye and sockeye, Canton especially. Um, if you live in the central part of the state, northwestern part of the state, this is the time to to go start hammering, hammering the rip rap along the dam. And then if they're generating any water from major rains going down in the stilling basin, uh, now that Corps of Engineers, they kind of open that up. Uh, you can fish from the bank. You don't have to fish off from the big seawall anymore. So uh, size body of water that's needed for walleye, sawgye. I mean, it's going to be anything from our, you know, medium, small impoundments all the way up to our major reservoirs. Uh, we've, we've stocked them fairly aggressively in the last decade. Um, throughout the state, but if you're looking for some smaller water, some of the southwestern lakes, Clear Creek, Duncan, Humphreys, those would be considered smaller bodies of water as opposed to, you know, some of the bigger reservoirs like Weber's Falls, Kerr, Eufaula, um, Hudson that have walleye um, and sawgye in them. Those are, it's going to be bigger water and, you know, in some in the southwestern part of the state, we just have better populations of them, so it's easier to get into them. Um, and then at times of the year, because walleye are a tougher fish to catch when they move out in that deeper water because you have to locate them. Um, if you don't have good electronics, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're, it's going to be a struggle to find fish. Uh, so this is really the time of year to get after them when they push up into that shallow water. So any body of water that has walleye and sawgye in them, um, you're going to want to be looking at the dam or if there's riprap areas around, uh, like fishing jetties, big points that come out that might have a feeder Creek that goes back in it. That's got lots of rocks and gravel, uh, especially on the wind blown sides of those coves and points. That's where those fish are going to be looking to push up. And then you have fish that are in the pre and post spawn during that time. They're not all spawning all simultaneously. So Really, when we're fishing spawning fish species, no matter what they are, we're not really fishing the spawn um, because when they are dropping eggs and doing things like that, they're really not interested in eating. So we're getting them in that pre-spawn and then immediately after they've spawned, um, then they're looking to recuperate. So you kind of find them in those, those areas where they're pushing up into the bank um, and they become very active. So uh we'll get into the kind of the baits now if you got any questions at any point please this is meant to be conversational so if you got a question in, um on whatever i'm talking about or just something you know while i saw guy fishing related just go ahead and type it in the chat box and we'll answer them as we go along and then we'll kind of have a q a at the end when we get through everything but now we're going to go through kind of what you're looking for to use uh walleye and saw guy you can make it as complex or as simplistic as you'd like um, there are some multi-purpose baits that you really don't need anything else. Um, so we're going to show all that. And then we're going to show some of the, the more advanced techniques and, and setups for fishing kind of out in the deeper water, or if you're trolling and things like that. But I'm going to start with the very basic stuff, what anybody can use, no matter your skill level, um, whether you fished for walleye and saw guy or not in the past, I'm going to start off with some stuff that, uh, 
um, you know, is, is going to work for just about any, anything. And there's good bycatch that you get with a lot of these lures and they're, it's a pretty simple, uh, set up. So with that, you know, we're looking for walleye really favor brighter colors. Um, for whatever reason, you know, they're in that darker water. You're trying to get their attention the way their eyes work, but purples, oranges, chartreuses, pinks, those are much more effective on walleye and sogeye than you get on your more traditional warm water species like bass and crappie and white bass that may occasionally take chartreuses and a pink or an orange, but typically they're looking for more natural colors, your whites, your uh, green pumpkins, um, blacks and blues, those types of colors that they're used to seeing. Um, walleye are much more aggressive on brighter, obnoxious colors that get their attention. Um, but with any of these baits that I'm going to show today, the biggest thing with walleye and sawguy fishing is maintaining contact with the bottom. Uh, these are fish that always are on the bottom of the water column. Uh, they, do, they don't come up high in the water column to feed. Um, they might sit up a few feet off the bottom if they're sitting in grass flats uh, or if they're sitting in a hole where they're waiting for current to push stuff over, they might be sitting a few feet up off the bottom in that hole, but they are always going to be in the bottom third of the water column. So either being able to maintain contact with the bottom or staying within a few feet of the bottom is going to be your best bet for success, which is great at this time of year because they're pushing into shallow water, typically under 12 feet. So in most cases, both boat and bank anglers have access to them because you can cast from the bank, let a jig or crankbait get down into 12 feet of water, and then you're reeling back to the bank and it's obviously going to get shallow as you're going up. So, um, but that, that's the biggest thing to remember. If you take anything away from this in order to be successful for walleye and saga, you, you need to be down on the bottom. So if that means up in your jig size up to like a quarter ounce to make sure that you're getting down or using a deeper diving crankbait, um, we'll kind of go through all that stuff. So like I said, purples, oranges, pinks, um, I favor purple a lot. That's a really good color for walleye. Um, and something that's just super basic. This is just a little uh, pre-packaged. These come in a five pack. It is just a Johnson brand, uh, just little boot tail, paddle tail swim bait. They sell these in eighth ounce and quarter ounce. So this is the quarter ounce one. Here's an eighth ounce one. And these are just perfect. We got a good hook here at the back of the tail. Um, it's another thing with most baits when you're fishing, the farther that you're any hook that you're using, whether it be a treble or a single point hook, the closer it is to the rear of the bait, the better hookup success that you get. So if you're using a jig head and you're putting it on to a grub or, or a swim bait or whatever you may be using, understand that the longer that that bait is and the shorter the hook shank is, you might get bit, but they're grabbing behind that hook point. So when you go to set the hook, you're not even in the fish's mouth with the hook. So the closer you can get to the back of the back of the tail. So these are a good one. These are back in the back third, but these come pre-packaged. They're like two bucks. So these are a really good value. Um, you can get the ones in, uh, in chartreuse or in white or kind of a sh uh, shad, kind of a speckle. So here's a box with different boot tails that are in here. We got the smaller ones over here for crappie and white bass and some of the larger ones over here for some hybrids and then for walleye and sawgye. But these are very basic. They come pre-packaged. Um, the, uh, the boot tails that I have in here, they're, it's VMC brand. They come in a two pack. Those are 32nd ounce and 16th ounce. So I basically have everything in here from 32nd all the way up to a quarter ounce. Um, and these little small ones, well, you're typically using these for, um, you know, crappie and panfish and, and white bass, these will catch walleye and sawgye of decent size as well. So if you're, if it happens to be that time of year and it is where you're going to get a lot of crossover in shallow water with white bass, hybrid striped bass, crappie, largemouth bass, and then walleye and sawgye, little swim baits, uh, little grubs, um, little worms, things that you know, typically catch multiple species. It's a great time of year. So if you can downsize uh, to a smaller bait, you'd be shocked at, you know, picking up. And especially if you're, you're getting into some smaller walleye and saw guy, like eight to 14 inch fish that are below the legal limit to keep, you know, then you might think of sizing up a little bit if you're only getting bit on those. But a lot of times 
something like this can be a great multi-purpose where you're just catching a lot of different fish. So if you're the type of person who, who just wants to up your ante for catching fish while you're out there, uh, 16th ounce and 32nd ounce, just little boot tails or curly tail grubs or little baby shad are great um, in bright colors. And you'll get a lot of uh, crossover bycatch. But this is about as simple as it gets. It's just a ball jig head, quarter ounce or eighth ounce. Eighth ounce is a really good happy medium for bank fishermen at this time of year because you're typically in less than 12 feet of water. So an eighth of an ounce is plenty. Um, you're going to be able to cast that out to the to your farthest point. So that's the deepest drop. Keep your bail open, let it fall down to the bottom and then close your bail. And then just a very slow retrieve. And this thing's going to sit up like this and you're just going to run this along the bottom. And that back tail is just going to create a vibration. Same thing goes for a curly tail grub. It's going to be whipping back there. Or if you wanted to put on like a trick worm, um, a curly tail worm, just, just something that's purple, pink, yellow, orange, something like that. But you want to just drag that along the bottom. If you can feel the bump, bump, bump along the bottom, you're in a perfect spot. Now, if you're fishing somewhere where maybe there's a lot of boulders or a lot of riprap and you're not getting good contact with the bottom because you keep getting hung up, then just pick up your retrieve speed a little bit and get it up off the bottom to avoid that. But that's why it's always great to start out with your cheap baits. You know, a jig head and a soft plastic is as cheap as it gets. So that gives you a good kind of search when you're fishing from the bank because you don't want to cast out a $10, $12 crankbait and first cast drill into something. So um, these are all really good basic baits to use. But again, it's just real slow, just enough so that you know that you're getting action with the bait, um, but you're maintaining either contact with the bottom or you're hitting the bottom every few hops. Um, but just a straight, steady retrieve when you're casting. Um, you're, you can vertically jig for walleye, um, but at this time of year, it's not necessary because they're up, they're aggressive. You can get them on hard baits, you can get them on soft baits, but in more uh, importantly, you're getting them on a cast and retrieve approach as opposed to vertically jigging for them uh, with live bait or something like that. So we'll go into the next box. This box kind of has an eclectic mix of walleye equipment but we got some bottom bouncing equipment over here so here's our lindy rigs here's some different bottom bouncing weights uh we got some grubs over here a little swim bait some grubs up here some rooster tails and then our different types of jig heads so depending on what videos you're watching who you're talking to like i said you can make walleye and saw guy fishing as complex or as simple as you want um, so different people are going to have kind of their different go-tos and with any type of fishing, it doesn't matter what it is, really what you're looking to do, find a time of year where you can go to a place and you can get confident with one or two different types of baits and then build on that success. Um, once you find success with something, there really isn't a reason to start experimenting with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so with any of these, you know, this is all going to be effective walleye and saw guy equipment, but you know, you're really looking for something on a style of fishing that you like that you can get confidence in. Cause once you have that, you know, you can go to other places and know that you have confident in confidence in that bait. So here's a floating jig head. You can pull these, you can make a leader, uh, and run this to one of these bottom bouncing weights. So Lindy rigs are great. Uh, kind of starter bait for bottom bouncing. Uh, that's for sure. Let's see. Are they good eating? Yeah, walleye. Walleye, sawgai, and sauger are, are arguably the best tasting freshwater fish that you can eat. Um, you get a nice big steak off of them, fillet them right down the side, just like you would a crappie or a white bass or catfish, and you get a nice good steak off of them. But they are they are very high quality table fare for sure. Um, so with our, if you buy a Lindy rig, a Lindy rig is going to be in a little black package with yellow writing. It's going to say Lindy rig on it. And they come with two different deals that you might find at a Bass Pro, a Cabela's, a, an Academy, Atwoods, Dick Sporting Good, you know, a major retailer. And they're going to come with either a half ounce or a quarter ounce weight. Um, they typically come with two per pack and then you get two, uh, get one of these out. Um, it's going to come with uh, your leader line. So the leader lines attach to 
basically a size one hook, size zero to size two hooks. Um, this is about a size one hook on that. And at the end of the leader, it comes with a, it's a loop on the end of the leader. So you would unwind this. Typically you unwind it. Uh, you can see in there where the, where they put the hook. So you want to unwrap it with the, not the hook, unwrap it with that. Cause if you start trying to get the hook and you pull it apart, you might get knots in it. So these are meant to be unwrapped with that about four or five times, and then it'll unwind. And when you get to that point, they come with swivels as well. And they're a little bit different swivel if you're not familiar with a Lindy rig. So they come with, it's, it's a half swivel. So on one side, it's like your traditional barrel swivel, nice little loop. And then on the bottom, it's got kind of this funky little figure eight. And what that does is when you go to put your loop on there, that loop, this is, think of this like a snap swivel. So all you do is you run your line along that bar that's up there and you just put it on the inside of that and then you just pull it tight on. Once you, it can be funky the first time, but once you do it once, so it'll look like that and you just kind of work it and pull until it snaps on there. And then it holds like that. So you would put this on your line. It's kind of bent, as you can see, it's crooked back this way your line goes through this side, not this side. So this little indent should be facing the way your line goes back up on your rod. Cause when you're trolling or you're casting and just letting this sit on the bottom, this is the side that bangs along the rocks and it's curved so it doesn't get hung up on stuff and it bounces along the bottom. So you'd put that on your main line and then you would just tie whatever knot you're comfortable with attaching line to your hook or a swivel, Palomar knot, improved clinch, tri line, tri knot, and put that on. And this would be unwound. And all you're doing with this is you can tie a dropper hook, like a stinger leader line with a treble hook on it. Um, or you just put the night crawler, night crawler on it. So these are meant to be fished with live bait. So you can either use a live minnow or you can use a night crawler. I like fishing for walleye with night crawlers. Um, some guys exclusively go with live minnows and they'll vertically jig for them and they'll sit on top of them. That's a very effective way. That's not how I fish for them. Um, but in instances like that, most of the time they're either using a long shank or a short shank, what's called a fireball jig head. So your main line attaches to the front, just like a normal jig. And you would either nose hole or however you like to uh, rig your minnow, you'd put it on the hook point. And then this eye hole back here is meant to tie on you can buy kind of pre-made uh stinger hooks to attach but essentially what you'd be doing is you'd be taking a leader line tying on line about six inches not very long and then you would attach a small to medium size treble hook on it and we can do that right here so you get an idea what that looks like but this is real. This is more of an advanced technique of vertically jigging. So that means that you need to locate fish and be right above them in a boat, and you're dropping straight down to them. You're letting the jig head go down, and all you're doing is occasionally going from three o'clock to noon. Just jig it straight up, let it fall back down to the bottom. Most times, you get, always get that hit on the flutter back down or when it's sitting on the bottom. Um, so if we it, Let's say that we're not tied on to our main line because you wouldn't want to be to do this. So we're going to attach, we're going to attach our leader line to the jig head on that back where the stinger line goes. We'll just do a quick improved clinch knot. Now, depending on what you want to use, I would recommend on if you're going to use a leader back here that whatever you're using for line for walleye or saw guy you can buy steel leaders and put them on like a wire leader because they are a toothy fish. Um, typically, it's not necessary. I very rarely have gotten broken off by a fish catching it in its teeth, but you can use a steel leader if you like. Um, but if you're using just regular line, stick with monofilament. Uh, fluorocarbon is way too abrasive. So if it does catch, it's more likely to break. 
and stick to like a 10, 12, 14 pound monofilament line. Um, so this right here is eight pound test. So this would be, this would be a little dicey, um, especially if you were catching some bigger fish, some four plus pound fish. So we'd take that. So we got it tied on and then we would attach our little stinger hook right here. If you're tying an improved clinch knot, if it's eight pound test, I do like five or six poles, turns around. Um, if you're using like 12, 14, you probably only need to turn it three or four times uh, because it's just, you know, the, the heavier it gets, it's just harder to, to get that knot to cinch up for you most times. So, and definitely give yourself a lot longer leader than I did to tie that knot on. We fell through already. So, but the point, and you don't have to use a stinger hook if you don't want to, you could just put the minnow on, but essentially what this does is whether you're using a worm or a minnow, uh, it's just an extra hook up there. So you would attach it in. Um, I'm just going to hold that on there. I made that line a little too short, but essentially this is what you would look like. You know, you're only about four inches of that leader. So when you have whatever your bait that you're putting on, uh, let's find something that we can put on it. Um, let's say that one of these is our, let's say this was our minnow. So if this was our minnow, however you like to rig them, if you go right through the top, if you go in through an open mouth and come up out through between the nose, or you go in between the nose holes, or you want to attach it in the back. But most of the time, this is meant to go right through the mouth of the fish. Don't bottom lip them because the fish will die. They won't be able to get water to their gills. So what you want to do is make sure the fish's mouth is open and then come out right between the nose holes. Don't go too far back because then you'll hit the brain and you'll kill the fish. So you would just go in through the mouth, pop it up between the little nose slats like this, and it'd be sitting on and you'd work it up to your hook point like that. And then all you'd be doing is on the back of that, whatever live bait you're using, whether it be a worm or a shad or a live minnow shiner, um, you would just take this and back behind its dorsal fin in between that and the, and your tail fin, you would just put one treble and just run it through the back again, being mindful not to hit any organs. You just want to run it through the skin and it would sit on like that. So when you're jigging this up and down and that fish comes and grabs it, you got the stinger hook up top. So if you get a big fish and engulfs it, you get a double hook up. But if it just grabs the back, you have this rear stinger hook to get that bite. Because if you just fish it without a stinger hook and you're just on a jig head and it's like this, you know, that's a lot of tail to grab. And like I said, the farther that hook points up, that fish can come in and grab like this. And if this was live bait, well, it's just going to rip your minnow right off. So you're just going to keep losing your minnows when you're getting bit. So if you want to vertically jig using something like this, uh, putting on a stinger hook is always a good idea. Then there's other types of jig heads that they come, come with, you know, something with a flasher on it. So you can jig this, do this. You could even, you know, you can tie off a stinger hook from here or off of that. Uh, but most of the time you put like a live night crawler, just thread up half of the worm onto the hook and let the back of the worm do its thing when it's underwater. Um, and you could just straight retrieve this in. You get a little flasher on it. You can vertically jig it up. This blade is going to be erratic coming up and going down, gets the attention. But you'll see several different types of jig heads that are advertised as being for walleye. And these are kind of the ones that you'll see. And they come in a few different colors. But so for these floating jig heads, what you can do is on something like a Lindy rig or a, a harness crawler, like a trolling, I'll show you guys those in a second. What you could do with this is you can just take a Lindy line and just cut your hook off right here because you already have the nice leader and then just tie this on right here. And again, same deal as with our jig heads that we just showed. If you're going to put live bait onto this or even plastic bait off of the back of this, uh, again, you can just go on, uh, you can just go off the back and just loop your line over, take, take a leader line 
and then just tie your, you know, turn it over and just tie an improved clinch right on there and then cut it like we did on the other one and just give yourself a little four to six inch leader and put a stinger hook on it, put a little small to medium sized treble and whatever bait you're running off of this. And all this does is it keeps it up off the bottom. So if you were trolling or you wanted to slowly cast and retrieve using a bottom bouncer, this is going to rise up basically however far, you know, however fast you're retrieving and how long your leader is to where your weight's at. So if you were to let this just sit with nothing else on it, it was just this attached to your swivel and you didn't do anything and you cast it out, well, it's going to rise up um, depending on how much weight is behind it. So if this had a night crawler on it, it's going to try to rise with it, but you're going to have some weight that's going to be forcing it. But this is great because this is always going to keep you within three feet of the bottom. Um, and some people will just throw just a like a little trick worm, something like this, and just thread it on there and pop it out and have it just sitting on just like that. And you would just slowly be trolling behind your boat uh, using a bottom bouncer. You can cast and retrieve with that bottom bouncer and just slowly retrieve it. And this is going to keep you nice and tight within the bottom. So those are just a few different options. But like I said, you want to find your comfort zone. What do you like to use? What have you had confidence in? Um, Because these are all effective ways to catch fish uh, once you learn how to do them and where to look to use them. But typically during the spawning season, you know, these are all great, but you really can just get by with a jig head um, and just straight cast and retrieve or using a crankbait because they are up in that shallower water. But the other times of year or during the daytime, especially as those fish suck back out, um, they're going to look for ledges, creek channels and holes. So if they're sitting up on a flat or they're off of a dam, they're going to go look to where that rebound current's coming back down, little turns in the river channel, um, any type of hole where the wind's blowing. So if you're ever trolling for walleye, troll with the wind because most of the time those fish, if they're sitting in holes, they're facing the wind blown because they're sitting in a hole waiting for food to get pushed over the ledge into the hole or into the creek channel. And they're just sitting there looking up, waiting for food to come over. So if you're trolling into the wind, you're running bait right through the backs of them, which you can spook them and disperse them. The only time where you're not running directly with the wind is if you're fishing the dam or maybe a long like main lake point or something like that, where you're going to be wanting to go parallel. So you'll be going perpendicular with the wind. Like if you had a south wind and you're on the north end of the lake, that wind's hitting you in the side as you're trolling down the dam. Because if they get into a windblown side, instead of sitting on the dam, looking back out into the deeper water with the wind, they sit down and they look up at the dam because what happens is you get rebound current. So all that bait fish and all the, you know, whatever they're looking for to eat is getting blown into the dam. And when it hits the dam, it turns that water over on the bottom and it creates a rebound current and those fish sit waiting for that rebound current. So trolling right along parallel with the dam or parallel with a big point that comes out or a main lake point. So if there's a big river channel that bends or something like that, or a hump, um, you're running parallel with it. That way you're not really spooking fish because they're kind of situated where you're running bait in front of them. um, And they're going to be kind of situated in different positions, but Uh, just know that if you're out there trolling, go with the wind or go parallel with your banks or your points. Um, You're going to hook up less likely going up against the wind because you're going to be pulling fish. You're going to be pulling it into the back of them. So you might be able to skirt it through a couple of fish without spooking them. And then they see it and they might give chase, but more likely they're looking for food coming directly to them. So that's something to look for with walleye because they, like most species that are feeding they like the windblown sides of lakes up against riprap where is their easy access to bait um and for walleye that's going to be shad minnow shiners um anything they can really get a hold of they like fish uh worms leeches things like that uh so anywhere where they're going to be able to get that coming right into their face whether it's on the back side of a ledge or cross getting rebound current from the dam those are the places to look if you're out trolling um Looking at depth line maps, if you don't have great electronics on your boat, uh, if you just have kind of a basic depth finder, it's always good if you go to wildlifedepartment.com and go on to our where to fish pages. They all have depth line maps where you can go and it's interactive so you can scroll around the lake. It's not an absolute science. You know, there's silt, but it's a culmination of data that's been gathered through GPS systems, NOAA, 
all of that to kind of map out the lake. So it gives you an idea when you get out there, pick a point, pick a feature off of something where you're looking for those big drops off of points out into deeper water. Cause that's what they like to use. They like to get from deep water to shallow water as quickly as possible. So wherever you have big river like channel turns that go up onto a big ledge that's susceptible to get hit with the wind a lot. Um, those are great places to look because those fish typically don't go very far. They're just moving up, up the bank, up the ridge on the point, and then back out into that deeper water. So those anywhere where you can find connections from shallow riprap um, or shallow flats that immediately hook out into deeper water, especially, you know, defined creek channels or big holes, um, main lake points offshore humps, things like that. If you can identify those on a depth line map at an area you've never been before, you don't have to be as heavily reliant on your electronics because you can kind of general area it and then start using your electronics to look for where those defined ledges and features are. Um, but if you just go out there blindly, you're going to be driving around for a while looking for that water on your electronics. So take advantage of using the old fashioned just depth line maps to start. Um, if you don't have all that stuff already programmed into fancier electronics that they make now. Um, so we have a couple of other different types of bottom bouncers that you can use. Um, something that looks like that, something that looks like this ones that come with a little line grabber on them. So you, they come with these clips. So your line can run through that. It keeps it off. If you were to put it right on that, it kind of sags the line. So this puts it on the plastic to hold it up. But again, most of the time, it's great to get some prepackaged snells. So they sell, uh, if you don't have Lindy rigs where you get those hooks, you can find a lot of different sized snell packages that look like this. They're also going to have a loop on them. So really all you need to run a bottom bouncing rig is a swivel with either a Lindy rig setup that has the, has the, the little turn figure eight point to hold it on, or you can just use a snap swivel, um, that and any type of bottom bouncing weight. And then you can use any type of prepackaged Snells. Some of them have double hooks on them. Some of them are single hook leaders. They're going to tell you the pound test, uh, size of the hook, quantity, you know, are they double rigged? Are they single rigged? But those are options that you have. Most of the time, just running a night crawler along the bottom with either just a plain hook, like on a Lindy rig, something like this, where you literally are just working half of your worm onto it and letting the other half hang out. And then you're just slowly trolling along those ledges and channels. Um, that works great. Super simplistic. And the bike catches good. So if you got kids or family members, like you're just trying to have an active day on the lake, semi-serious about fishing, um, trolling Lindy rigs is great because you're going to catch a drum, catfish, white bass sometimes, just depending on where you're at. But just trolling a night crawler along the bottom is a great way to just hook up on fish you don't have to troll very fast just enough to where your rod tips are bent over um i like using spinning reels to troll because i can set the drag really good so if you hit the bottom or you, you hit a fish it's hooking itself up but it's allowing that line to pull off now if you're really confident in your bait casters or something like that where you have nice ones that have good bait clickers or anything like that you can use those but i use spinning reels is what i'm comfortable with i set the drag reel loose and then when i hit a fish and i go to get it out of the rod holder um you know i might give it just an extra pull as i go to start to reel to reset that hook um but trolling lindy rigs or trolling harness crawlers so you'll see these at some sporting goods stores basically like a lindy rig but they're going to come with a, either a float or some type of spinner or a float and a spinner. So they come prepackaged, usually in a two pack. They have lots of different colors, um, but again, bright colors. Walleye are native to the north. They really key in on yellow perch, which is kind of what most people know of as fire tiger. You'll see things packaged as fire tiger, or fire perch. Um, those are imitating a yellow perch which is not native to oklahoma we don't have yellow perch here but that is a walleye's main 
uh, food source up north. So where they're native. So they still have that ingrained in the DNA to look for, you know, your, your perch type colors. Um, but yellows and blacks, I really like uh, kind of a white with a red. This picks up a lot of multi-species, but it's a good walleye one. You can also buy and build your own harness crawlers. Super simple. Uh, you're, they're going to come, you know, you can get the floaters, you can get beads, you'll get different types of blades. So if you wanted to experiment, you can get like purple and pink and then, you know, purple tiger, or purple, pink tiger, usually what they're labeled flashers. Um, and then they're just, they're pretty easy to set up. Basically you can, you can use a, a snelled rig. So if you bought one, uh, I don't know if I have any doubles here. But if you bought one where you had, so here, so something like this. So these are doubled. These are already snelled on there. You could just take one of these out of the package and then cut the loop at the top to retie it. And then you would slide your, uh, either your float or your beads and then your spinner down on top of it. And then if these ever break, like the prepackaged ones, you can always put them back together. So uh, if we were if we were to have our hook, so let's say I was tying this on to to make my own, uh, what it would look like. If I didn't already have the hook tied on, you can do it both ways. You can build it before you put the hook on, or you can tie the hook on and then cut your leader to your length. And then before you loop knot it for yourself or before you tie it onto your swivel, uh, you can build it from the top up. Either way, your float is going to go right up against your hook point. So, you know, whichever way you want to put it on, usually the usually the dual color, the lighter colors up against the hook, darker colors back here. Then you're going to put your bead. So if you're buying to make for yourself, you know, different color beads that come with them. So you would put your bead up above. That's going to be up above. So your hook is going to be below. Then this goes on, then your bead, and then you put your flasher on. And then typically, you know, the flasher has writing on it. So you just run it down the line where if you were looking at it like this, that little UV right there, the writing is right side up. But it doesn't really matter because um, they're the same shape and they're going to spin unless they're just on a clip that's meant to be put on a certain way. And if that's the case, it usually tells you that on the packaging. But you can buy these in bulk. Like you can buy flashers and this stuff for super cheap. And it's just a great way to catch a lot of fish, not necessarily walleye and saw guy. It is a, it is a good tool to catch them. It is effective. If you want to fish with just a night crawler, super easy troll off the back, give yourself a little bit extra flash as opposed to your Lindy rig, which Lindy rigs are great, but you got to put it in front of the fish. You know, you're not getting any vibration or flash to attract fish in the area. So you got to get pretty close to fish with the scent of the worm and everything else. Um, so your harness crawlers are great because you're getting the flash and vibration. It attracts predators in. Um, and then when you have a night crawler off of the back of it, uh, so all of these are snelled. So they're dual hooks. You just take your night crawler on one end and put it on the hook point. I will double it over. So I'll just wrap it once and re put it through. So it's hooked twice and then run it down to the rear and hook it on once and then turn it and hook it. So it's double hooked each time, just so in case I hit something, it's less likely to pop off. Um, but super effective, especially in the summertime, getting out in the deeper water, you can catch blue cats, channel cats, flatheads occasionally. Um, not that that's a rarity, but you can catch them. Um, but you get into white bass sometimes. You run stuff like that right through a school of white bass. They're going to hit that worm and flasher. Um, you catch a lot of drum, so that's fun for kids and people who don't fish that often because you get the opportunity to catch a, you know, you might hit an 8, 12-pound drum. That gives you, that gives you, you know, a good tug on your line. It's fun. It's a good bycatch. It's always fun to catch big fish uh, when you're not targeting them. So uh, that's kind of, these are kind of the go-tos. Like if you're looking for something, especially for trolling, your bottom bouncers with Lindy rigs um, or some type of harness crawler, and then your weight, you got different options for your weight. And then just throw in just a basic, get a cup of night crawlers and throw them on there. Um, and you're going to find success. And the bycatch is great. So 
you know, if you're not catching walleye and sawgai that day, odds are you're probably getting into something else. Uh, I very rarely do I ever troll around anywhere, even on water that's not overly great, like Lake Hefner. You know, it's not it's not a great fishery. There's some good fish in there, but it's not overall a great fishery. But even trolling out there, take the wife and the kid and friends, you you hit fish. So always fun. You're always gonna you're always gonna hit something using something like that. So then what else do I got in this box? So at this time of year when they're up in the shallows, you know, you could try like a big, brightly colored inline spinner, big rooster tail. Again, something that's kind of in a perch pattern. Kind of that purple tiger, purple pink tiger, uh, or just a straight chartreuse gold flasher. Again, the bycatch at this time of year, you might hit hybrids, you might hit white bass, um, you might even catch, you might even hit a largemouth bass using something like this, uh, or some of the bigger ones. You know that here's some bigger ones that are not your typical, a little different than a rooster tail. Kind of got our our metal, our meps, big spinners, um, but things like this. Again, whatever you feel comfortable and confident throwing, but this is the time of year to, to throw things like this up in the shallows because they're they're getting up there in droves. Uh, yeah, I mean, do they run in schools? Yeah, they technically, I mean, you sometimes it could be four or five fish together. Other times there could be dozens of them. It just kind of depends on what, you know, what the habitat is. How much space do they have? Is there a good feeding source? Is there a... A big population um you know a lot of times fish they like to stay in schools of fish that are the same size as them um so when you find fish if you have a good stocking class or a good recruit class from reproduction and you have a bunch of fish that are all kind of in a few inches difference of each other within kind of the same body profile they'll hang out together um typically you don't see schools of schooling fish with real small all the way up to real big you'll find schools of you know a smaller size fish schools of medium size fish schools of bigger fish and those can vary on how many fish are within that school just based on population in the lake habitat forage weather conditions lots of different factors but usually when you find walleye there is more than one in the area that you're fishing so if that answers the question uh then we we have just basic grubs so like a purple or a chartreuse um so here's here's some good colors here's a a three inch purple and a four inch purple mr twisters you'll find these in most oklahoma retailers cheap get a what do these come in 25 here's a 25 pack so these are 25 packs is typically what you find them in retail, but you can buy them online in the 50 packs and the 50 packs are like five bucks. These are like three bucks. So pretty cheap option, but oranges, purple, chartreuse, clear, chartreuse glow, stuff like that. And you can work them on, if you want to use, you know, you could put them on a fireball jig head where you kind of have a shorter profile so it sits up better on the bottom as it's going across. You could throw them on a flasher jig head, something like this. You can throw them on a roadrunner head, something like that. You can throw them on just a very basic ball head jig. Or you can throw them on a Ned head jig. Uh, I don't have any Ned head jigs in front of me, but if you're familiar with Midwest fishing techniques, they're becoming more popular and you're seeing them in different brands. But essentially, it's a mushroom cap type shaped head. And if you were to just stand it up on a flat surface, it stands up. So it helps when you're reeling because it keeps the bait profile up, which helps you stay out of getting hung up. Because if that hook point starts to lay down on you, you know, you can run it into the back of something. But if it's up higher, then the head of the jig is hitting first and you're hopping over stuff. But you know, whatever jig head you want to use, two inch, three inch, four inch grubs, just curly tail doesn't, you know, these are Mr. Twister brands, but every box brand that sells curly tail grubs, trick worms, anything like that, you know, just you're looking for bright colors, chartreuse, orange, pink, uh, purple mixtures, dual colors, purple and white, 
pink and white, chartreuse and white, orange and white. Uh, so like this box right here, we have what are, uh, these are called finesse worms. Uh, these are Zoom. I think they're just Zoom package, Zoom finesse. Some people call them trick worms, but it's basically just a, you know, four or five inch deal. And you'd run this off the back of a jig head, or you could run it, you could run it with the stinger hook and run it on a fireball jig head and, uh, or make your own leader, what you want to use. But those ribbed minnow. So we have our curly tail minnow, and then this is the ringworm. So, yeah. So here's the ringworm, and then here's a minnow. Very similar. This one's got just a little bit deeper body. This one's got a little bit more slender body, but they both have the curly tail off the back. Good color, orange and yellow. Then we have our uh, kind of a pink and chartreuse, pink and yellow with some sparkle flash through it. A little bit brighter pink, almost more of kind of like a neon pink purple with a chartreuse yellow body. Straight chartreuse. That's got a bad glare on it. Something like this. Or just kind of our purple pinkish and purple pinkish purple and black so pretty you're kind of getting the theme here of of the color schemes that you're looking for and all of these again can be fished on just straight jig heads jig heads where you put a leader with the stinger hook on it just so you have it in the back um you can run them off of different types of jig heads some that have flashers some that don't again the main thing keeping it near the bottom and just putting it in front of that fish and you know, like I said, the first deal that I showed, which is the little Johnson boot tails, that's really all you need. You know, you can just, you get a package of these and when the fishing's good, when they're up shallow, eighth ounce jig head, cast and retrieve right along the bank. When they're there, that's all it takes. You don't need anything more than that. Um, back in marinas, if you ever, if there's places where walleye will move back into a marina, maybe to try to spawn or if they're post spawn and they there's bait fish that get pushed up in there and they come in you know especially on the next full moon april uh when the water temps are a little bit warmer they're pro they probably concluded their spawning uh walleye it's going to vary from lake to lake but a pretty good number for average of when walleye what water temps they spawn in is 44 to 48. so we're right there in every body of water in the state and they like to spawn on that first full moon so of the spring, which is March. So th today is that day. So basically if you're looking for walleye fishing, that's good up in the shallows and the overnight hours, look at hot places uh, for walleye, like an Altus Luger, a Canton, um, where you have great bank access along the dams. Uh, Canton's got the fishing jetties that come out. Um, and then they have the stilling basin down below that has now has access down at bank level, as opposed to being up on the seawall. So, those are great places to look right now. Uh, Sogai, usually with Sogai, we start to see kind of a better catch rate as we get into April, a little bit later than the walleye. So, but again, these two full moons in March and April, those that week of that full moon is really the time to fish super shallow. So right up against the dams, uh, any riprap, um, marinas along the banks, things like that, basically from dusk until dawn. Um, they're going to be active. They'll start to push in or get active, you know, an hour or so before dusk all the way up until, you know, maybe 10 a.m. 9, 10 a.m. is before that sun starts to get too high. But after that, those fish are going to suck back out into those channel breaks. So if you can fish from a boat, it's great because you can be right on top of them all night long. But in the lead up hours in the evening or in the morning, after you get out of that, you can take your boat and follow them right back out into wherever they're going on the first real break that they get. So they're looking for the first ledge, first hole, and then switching over from cast and retrieve with crankbaits or soft plastics, then going back to trolling or vertically jigging. So if you can spot lock or drop anchor or hold with your trolling motor, just where you're marking a ton of fish, that have pushed back out and are sitting in a hole, that's the time to just get right over the top of them and vertically jig or mark them, come back around and then just troll through them and just keep going back and forth and pick up as many fish as you can. Um, with walleye, I mean, 
it, that's it's fun to catch a ton of fish, but walleye and sawgye are the one fish where I'm you're looking to catch six because they're you know they're such good table fare where it's like six keepers and you're done um because they're good eating so for me personally there's lots of species that i'll go catch as many fish as i can because i have no interest in cleaning them um or i'm just not cleaning them that day but with walleye you know you're probably not on the water for multiple hours catching dozens and dozens of fish unless they just aren't of legal limit because usually you're keeping your limit and then you're out but that's kind of the that's kind of what you're looking for at this time of year get them up in the shallows around the full moon um overnight and then during the day go to the first channel breaks from where those good shallow spawning areas are and just look for the first holes river turns main lake points that they can get easy access to and then just troll or jig through them uh after the spawn what depths do they normally stay so if they're they're gonna continue to feed post spawn so in the overnight hours they're gonna push right back up into those shallows so basically for the next six weeks, maybe even eight weeks, you're looking in water less than 10 feet. In some cases, less than four feet. It just depends on the body of water that you're in. Um, windblown sides of the dams. Um, and then in areas where you have upstream migration, like a mountain fork, you're going to want to look at fishing the shoals or the narrows, you know, right now that next couple of weeks it's going to be hot of fish that are pushing up into that to spawn instead of spawning in the main lake but a lot of places like you know a hefner a canton um canton doesn't really have you know they can go up the canadian um but typically by the time that the water's coming down the canadian for the white bass to run we've already kind of gone past what the walleye you know temperature what they're looking to spawn at so typically in canton they're spawning right up along that dam which is on the south end of the lake so it makes it a little bit different so like today today you know we got that little fight of winter where earlier this week it was great and nice but now on a deal like canton that's a north facing dam so the wind is blowing straight into it so on a night like tonight on the full moon it's a little chilly but the fishing is going to be probably pretty good along that dam with the north wind because you're getting all that wind blown coming down into it. So you're getting what they like. So the fish that aren't actively spawning are going to be looking for food um, up in that shallow, but that's, that's what you're looking for. So depth, depth is just dependent on where you're at. What you're really looking for is your dam riprap and then coves, shallow coves that have long drawn out rocky points fishing along the wind blown side of that point all the way back into the cove. So at a place like Lake Arcadia, where the dam is at the big tower, there's a long cove that comes out of the deepest water. There's a huge hole, big 45 foot hole. That's not very big. It's just in a big circle right off the tower that jumps up real quick into about 12 feet of water. And then there's brush that runs all the way down where the crappie like to hang out. And those sogai will come right up out of those holes and they'll run right up those points and they'll go, they'll cruise all the way into the back of those uh, coves. I mean, you can catch them in a foot of water all the way out into 10, 12, 14, 16 feet of water. Just, you know, different fish are at different stages. Um, but that's what you're looking for. Windblown sides of points and dams at this time of year, if they're not generating water. And if you're in an area where it's a pretty easy fishery, you know, not a huge tailwater like a Keystone or a Eufaula. If it's just like an Ellsworth or um, like Thunderbird, areas where you can get down below a spillway, but the spillway isn't very big. Those are great places um, to target walleye and sawgye because it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. They don't have anywhere to go. So anytime you're generating water at any time of year uh, below bodies of water that have walleye and sawgye, it's worth going and throwing some casts in the stilling basin or in that tailwater. Um, so let's look at our uh, kind of our hard baits. We're going through all the best baits first. This is all the stuff that's going to be the most productive. And then when we get past that, I'll show some things that you can throw that you might find success with, but you're going to get a lot of crossover catch with a lot of bycatch. Um, and again, any questions come up, feel free to, to throw them in there and we'll address them as we go. So with crankbaits for walleye and sawgye, we're looking for long slender baits. So we're not, we're not looking at our typical classic bass short stubby bodies we're looking for the long slender things 
things that look like this. You know, purples, pinks, again, our, our fire tiger, our yellow perch, blue backs, kind of gold, some different options, some chartreuses, but big, long, slender crankbaits. And with these, what I would do, especially if you were fishing from the bank, because hard baits are expensive. Um, there's just no way around it. You can buy the bargain bin ones for three or four bucks, but that's still way more expensive than, you know, a 50 pack of these and a thing of jig heads. So when you're running hard baits, especially if you're running them from the bank and you're not familiar with the underwater terrain, what I recommend doing with these baits and what I, what I will do if I'm not using them out for trolling, because a lot of times I'm just going to troll hard baits right where I would be bottom bouncing. Sometimes I'll run a bottom bouncer and run a crankbait off the other side to just see if they're favoring one or the other. But on something like this, what I will do is I will remove this front treble hook. I'll take, I'll work it off of the clip and I will take that off. I will take off the rear treble hook and I will just put a single point straight shank hook. So a thick wire, you know, size one aught hook off of the back so that you can bang this into the bottom all you want and you just have one single point hook off the back that's where the hit comes from anyways so you don't have to go with a huge hook you know you could use a size one um you know just little like a wide gap hook just something where you're getting your trebles out of the way now you could just remove the front treble and just keep the rear treble because again you're banging it like this so it's up high but you got multiple points, so you find just one little twig or one branch that, that can get hung up on. Um, it's just always a dangerous game when you're reeling crankbaits from the bank because you're essentially working against yourself. Water's going this way. This thing's diving this way. So as it starts to come back towards you, it's hitting everything going up that hill, which is a good thing when you're walleye fishing and saw guy fishing because you want to be on the bottom, but not so great when those triple hooks find everything that's down there. So you want to save some money especially in areas you're not familiar with. If it's not sandy bottom, if it's not something where you know you're not going to get hung up, I recommend at the very least remove the front treble because that's never helping you. The only thing the front treble ever does most of the time is when the fish gets hooked, when this is out of its mouth, it ends up slapping into it and you end up throwing the front hook into the side of its face um, to get the kind of the double hook up. But they're always trying to attack from behind and below. So they're going to hit the back of that bait. So that's a little tip for saving some money. So here's a little bit shorter profile one. Again, we take this off. Um, now, if you're in a boat, you can recover your crankbait. So very rarely do you get hung up with the crankbait in a boat where you can't go get it back. Just, you know, give yourself slack, troll back over the top of it, make sure you're behind it. And in most cases, it'll just start to float up because it's you've released the tension. So anytime that you get hung up and you're out on the boat, just open up your bail. Don't try to mess with it. Just open the bail, go back around, drive your line back till you're past it. And then in most cases, that is you're back behind it. Close your bail, give it a couple of reels. And then once it feels the tension, it just pops it right back towards you. But you can usually finesse them out if you're on a boat. But don't get that luxury when you're fishing from the bank. In addition to, you know, some of these. So here's... Some different options, you know, here's a, here's another kind of purple one. This one's going to be kind of a finger length. Some of the longer ones, you know, this is going to be about the size of my finger for the body. And then you got the lip on it and you can run these. A lot of times what I'll do if you're trolling is get a shallow diving slender crankbait. So something that doesn't go very deep, like a one or two foot runner and bottom bounce it. So run your leader line from your bottom bouncing setup, like you're running bait and then tie it off to this and you want to get a floating one. You don't want a sinking one, but a floating bait, it's going to drag it down to the bottom. And if you were sitting still, well, the bait's going to rise up however far it can, however long your leader is. But as you're trolling, if you give yourself a three foot leader off of that, well, it's never going to bang into the bottom. So that puts your hard bait a foot off the bottom with using that. Cause if you just throw a big deep diver out there, it, that takes a lot of practice of what's the depth that it dives at? How fast is my boat supposed to be going? Are you running it off of a planer board? Are you running it off of a dipsy diver? Um, the easiest way to do it is just to get a shallow floating diver, 
give yourself a three foot leader line and then whatever bottom bouncing weight you use, fish it just like that. So you toss it out behind your boat, start your troll, and then you get a nice little retrieve and you're about a foot up off the bottom. So that that's a happy way to get down into that zone without having to overthink it. That's just a quick, easy way to do it. And you don't have to worry about getting hung up as often. But blue backs, orange bodies, little silver flash, again, kind of the long slender type body. These are a little bit deeper, but still these are, these are good walleye baits. Um, here's kind of that yellow perch. This is kind of a real life version um, as opposed to the, more cartoony version that you usually see. This is kind of a real yellow perch, but here's another one. So this is just kind of a sinker uh, with a spinning blade on it. These are really good up in the shallows for cast and retrieve because it's not diving on you. So your depth control is based on how much it weighs and how fast you're reeling it. So you could let this fall down to the bottom, close your bail and then start your retrieve and then just time your retrieve with, you know, keeping it just a little bit up off the bottom. So these are a good option as well because you can control your depth with your speed as opposed to the lip. Um, and then your, how deep it dives versus how fast you're cranking and things like that, that, that come with experience. So if, if you don't have a lot of experience with running hard baits, um, stick with shallow divers to start, um, even fishing from the bank. Uh, until you get more comfortable with it and then removing the front trebles from them and then even replacing the rear treble if you wanted to do that with a single point but making sure you get that front one off it's it's going to save your bait and the whole point is you want to be banging it into the bottom you want that lip you know you should be feeling every few cranks that you're catching the bottom from the bank as you're reeling it back into you and those walleye are just sitting there and they're going to come right up behind it and grab it because all that looks like if you've ever been to a river where you can really see bait fish they sit on the bottom and a lot of them tail up. So they're feeding along the bottom. So they're at about a 45 degree angle and they just flash and wobble like this. And they slowly work their way up the stream. It's what those predators are looking for. So they come right up behind them. So you get great lifelike activity running that um, lip down into the bottom. Uh, let's see, do we have anything else? These are all jerk baits. Jerk baits can be beneficial when they're up in the shallows as well. So your flashy, kind of flashy jerk bait, something like this, purple chartreuse, you know, just couple, crank, let it sit, crank, let it sit, crank, let it sit, crank, let it sit. Not, you know, you don't think of jerk baits for a walleye typically, you know, these are bass lures, things like that, but we're just looking for the body size that's right, which these are, the colors that are right, which these are. And when you're in less than four feet of water, this is going to grab fish's attention so you can catch them on jerk baits. If you got jerk baits lying around, I would, you know, especially if you got a brightly colored one, I'd work that in and around these, you know, same areas, uh, you know, and then something like this where you can just kind of a shallow cranker. You can run this. This isn't going to go very deep. You get a lot of good flash on it. This looks just like a golden shiner. Got that nice dark back, nice bright underbelly, just running this back into you. So good time of year for crankbaits, especially from the bank as these fish move up into the shallows. Um, here's some brighter colored ones, something like this. Got a nice orange and yellow, a little bit of a tail behind him. Same deal. You could fish this like a crankbait, crank and stop. It'll rise, crank and stop. Or you can just slow, you can always slow retrieve a crankbait, um, especially in shallow water because you get that nice little wobble on them. Um, and that's what those walleye are looking for. So fishing a, fishing a jerkbait like a crankbait works great for walleye. Um, all right. So that kind of brings us through our best baits. Um, you know, you can also use a lot, a worm and a bobber. So if you're fishing back in the marina or if you uh, are fishing on the dam and those fish are sucked up in there and you're only in four feet of water, you know, two, three feet below a fixed bobber, just put a night crawler on it, let it hang off a hook. That will catch fish as well. Um, so anytime they're in the shallows, live bait, artificial bait, you know, it's just, it's that great time of year where they get up into those shallow areas. So you have lots of different options. Um, so anglers of all different skill sets, uh, whatever equipment you may already have lying around, there's a good chance if you got a tackle box of, you know, a few different types of options, you probably have something already where you don't need to run to the store that's going to catch walleye and sawgye. 
So let's go through our kind of non-traditional baits here quickly um, that will catch walleye, but I, I at least don't think of as walleye baits, but good time of year, especially in places where you have hybrids and sand bass. So a Canton uh, Altus Luger, little sassy shad. So a sassy shad is Mr. Twister's brand name. But basically what you're looking for is a short, stubby paddle tail. Two to three inches, deep body. Again, very basic. Throwing them on just a ball jig head uh, or a flasher jig head, a roadrunner jig head. If you just keep this down near the bottom, these are going to get bit. Uh, so if you have a bunch of sassy shad, especially like the chartreuse ones or the brighter colored ones, definitely run those down along the bottom. Those are going to find you some success. Uh, here's some other kind of jerk baits, traditional Rapala, the original minnow. You know, again, you can just slow retrieve these and they'll wobble, or you can fish them like a jerk bait, let them rise. Some of them are sinking, some of them are floating. Those will those will find some fish. You can also you you can catch them occasionally on your more traditional crankbait, your bass crankbait. But if you're using these, especially if you're targeting white bass, hybrid, uh, or largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, if these are down near the bottom and you're fishing around dawn and dusk in areas that have walleye and sawgai, you will get bit. Um, but not something that you know you're typically thinking of for walleye. But again, it's a great time of year where there's lots of different bycatch. So. It's fun catching lots of different types of fish. Uh, this is kind of my striper box. So we got real, real big swim baits in here, but uh, magic shad or some type of jointed swim bait where it's got the back like that, running that on some type of either uh, bladed jig head, something like this, or just a basic ball jig head. Uh, you could Texas rig it, but as long as you're down along the bottom, these, uh, these jointed swim baits, and we got nice little purple color that they like. So these and these will catch walleye. Um, it's just with walleye, it's you're better off using hard baits unless you're using cheap soft plastics. Because when you start using expensive soft plastics, you will find that you don't catch very many fish before they're ruined because they do have teeth. So catching walleye and sawgai on hard baits is more cost effective if you can keep your hard bait from getting snag and losing your hard bait. Otherwise, cheap little paddle tails, cheap little worms, uh, cheap little swim baits on just basic jig equipment. You know, less than 10 bucks, you can get everything you need to go walleye fishing at this time of year. Uh, either pre-molded swim baits or our long slender boot tail swim baits on a, these are the new Storm 360 where the Soft plastic is matched to the head so that when you pull it, you go buy new ones, they fit up on the head for a more lifelike deal. But these are good. Um, that color, kind of a brighter deal. Just running them along the bottom, real nice and slow. Crappie gear, if you're out crappie fishing in a place that has crossover, Thunderbird, Lake Arcadia, Altus Luger, I mean, basically anything. If you have good habitat, so crappie like the same type of habitat to spawn in that walleye and sawgai do. They prefer hard bottom, gravel, things where you get wind blown. It's, you know, sunfish like bass, uh, you know, bluegill, things like that. They like more sheltered water because uh, they're building their beds. They're aerating the beds themselves. They're fanning it with their tails. Um, the fish that really like that hard bottom, they're relying a lot on current and wind to aerate the eggs. So you'll, especially sawgai, you'll find sawgai mixed in with the crappie because they're kind of moving up at exactly the same time. Um, so when you're using, when you're using your crappie baits, your little baby shad, uh, even the little kind of appendage baits like jokers, tubes, um, they will find, you know, even something like this that isn't very big, a little baby shad, You'd be shocked. You can catch, you know, two, three, four pound walleye or sawgai just on something like this. As long as you're just running it near the bottom. When they're up there, they're looking to feed. So they get super aggressive. And typically all it is is just finding that, 
that right color scheme. And most of the time that's going to be purple, orange, chartreuse. You know, you don't, doesn't usually take you very long to find them, uh, find the right color once you're in them really good. And then, then once you're catching fish, it's easy to switch up, try different things. Cause it's always fun to experiment when you're already catching fish. Lipless crankbaits. This would probably be, I would say the least likely to pull. Um, but you get them near the bottom again, right speed, right tempo, right color. These will bang a walleye or a saw guy. Um, and again, the bycatch is great. So if you have if you're targeting white bass or hybrid striped bass, striped bass, you know, wherever you're at, it's that time of year. There's just a lot of crossover of fish in the same area. So something like that. Jigging, jigging slabs and blades. So if you're in an area, you know, the blades especially, you could run those in because you can straight cast and retrieve them. So again, just like your lipless crankbait, if it's down near the bottom, put it in the right area with the right fish, they're going to grab it. Um, but the, the jigging slabs, like I would, if you're walleye fishing, you're better off going with live bait on some type of fireball jig or, you know, something that's meant for jigging off of the bottom. Um, but it doesn't mean, again, fishing for hybrids, fishing for white bass, you get a lot of crossover, you're out over main lake ledges or holes, and you're jigging down on the bottom, you can grab saw guy and walleye with uh, jigging slabs and spoons. And then some smaller grubs, things, again, crossover bites from panfish and uh, hybrids and white bass. Still pretty basic color schemes in there. Got some natural colors up here on the top. Lots of chartreuses, whites, pinks, kind of that perch color. So that brings us through all of our bait selections that I have. Um, what's the best Oklahoma lake for walleye? Depends on who you're talking to. Um, Canton is thought of as one of the tops. Altus Luger is thought of as one of the tops. Um, but there's some surprising areas for walleye. Uh, Hudson's got a pretty good population of nice fish. Kerr, Weber's Falls. Um, so there's lots of hidden honey holes around the state that guys don't talk about where we have stocked walleye historically that have taken root where it's just not a species that's targeted very often. Um, but saw guy in particular becoming more prevalent across the state. You know, they're going to grow to the same sizes. Um, they're, in a lot of cases can be a little bit more aggressive, especially in this, as we come into the springtime, um, you know, they'll move up, but yeah, Northeast lakes, uh, the Arkansas river has got great sauger in it. We're kind of right in that right now um, in and around Jinx and Tulsa underneath those bridges where you have big deep channels uh, running some of the smaller baits, like the little, little boot tails um, or little grubs out in the Arkansas river can yield some really nice saw guys. So some of these smaller profile baits, you know, three inches and under dragging those along the bottom of the Arkansas and those deep holes beneath the bridges, uh, they stack up in pretty good numbers sometimes and they they're great to eat. So if you can pound fish out of that 14 to 18 inches, like those are great eater fish. Um, you really can't tell much of a difference between walleye and saw guy and them. So that's a good place. Um, like I said, Hudson Kerr, they're going to have, walleye in them but again it's pretty big water so if you're if you're there yeah i mean below the dam but i'd really be going up uh the river like i'd go up in the osho um look for feeder creeks walleye they might go up big cabin creek rock creek um you know they're gonna run with those white bass but you know targeting looking for this time of year the north end of those lakes where any anywhere where you have you know big tapered points that come out into that deeper water where there's migration paths for them would be where I'd look. Um, anywhere below tailwaters is always going to be, you know, looking for saw guy for sure. Uh, you know, walleye as pure walleye, it's, you know, that's limited to lakes. Um, it, it's not very many, you know, we're really hybrids. We can produce some, those saw guys. So, you know, we put those in a lot more bodies of water. So, you know, a lot of times people think they're catching walleye, but they're really catching saw guy. Um, but there's not a difference as far as how you fish for them. Um, anybody else got any questions? Walleye and saw guy, we don't, there's not quite as many baits to talk about. I can kind of run, 
I know one of the one of the things that's the bottom bouncing stuff of just how you you kind of get set up on things like this. Rods and reels. So here, this is my walleye saw guy rod. So this is a seven foot medium heavy tapered rod um, with 12 pound test on a spinning reel. Um, I bought this as a package. I think I got this at Cabela's. It's just a loose speed stick. Um, it's kind of just a medium model. I think I got this for around a hundred bucks. It might've been one of those $99 specials, but you certainly don't need anything this high tech. This is just, I have this cause I know I can hold on to anything with it. So if I tag a really, really big fish, that rod is having no issues with anything, but I also run a very cheap setup, just a Walmart ugly stick. This is a six foot medium ugly stick, nothing fancy. Uh, got just a Abu Garcia black max, which is one of the kind of medium lower end reels. Um, so not super expensive reel. I got 10 pound braided line on it attached to, uh, you know, just the, 14 pound pre-packaged harness crawler and a, and a half ounce weight. So I almost always troll with a half ounce. I'm looking to run water that's under 30 feet most of the time. So I don't, I don't up into the one ounce, ounce and a half, two ounce weights. You can, if you want to really go after fish in deeper water, but with a half ounce weight on just a little cheap setup like this, this does just fine. And I can hold on to most fish. It's got a pretty soft tip on it. So get, I can play it. That's again, having an open face spinning reel that you can get a good drag set on, you know, as long as your drag can hold on to it and you have enough backbone. So a medium action rod, not a medium light, um, unless it's a higher end medium light rod that maybe is longer seven foot or seven foot two. That's going to give you you more. If you're sticking with the six foot or six, if you're under seven feet, you definitely want to have a medium action rod, if not a medium heavy, just so you have enough backbone down here if you get into a good fish. But then the these ugly sticks, they have real soft tips at the top. So you you can play the fish pretty easily just using the drag in your reel. So um, you don't need super fancy equipment to walleye and saw guy fish. You can literally get a Shakespeare ugly stick combo model at a Walmart for 20 bucks. 10 pound test, 12 pound test and a night crawler or just a curly tail grub with an eighth ounce jig head. As long as you're in the right place um, at the right time, you know, you're going to get on those fish. And that time is now we are, we are in that for the walleye spawn. Um, but looking for fish around the full moons up in that shallow water, wind blown sides of the lake, wind blow, blown sides of the dam, um, any type of current. So if you have, uh, if you have incoming water, if you have inflow from any, you know, of your feeding tributaries, looking at the mouths of those going up, if you have a boat or there's bank access up the mouths of those looking below riffle runs, shoal runs, you know, the holes underneath them, um, plugging through those down below, uh, below tailwater. So below the dam spillways, but this, this is the six weeks to look for them, uh, to get them in that shallow water. It happens again in October, um, the full moon in October. They push back up shallow again, looking to feed, getting that gorge on in the fall before the uh, kind of winter lull for them as all fish kind of just uh, get a little inactive in December and January compared to other times of the year and the dead of summer. Uh, let's see. Do you have a, a listing of the lake stocked in what species? Uh, I'm not sure what's currently on our website. I know historically we've put stocking reports on there and it says how many fingerlings of walleye and saw guy that we put and in what lakes during that year. So if you just go to wildlifedepartment.com, click the fishing tab, and then I believe there's a, a tab that says reports on it, uh, go to that. Otherwise you can just call the department and go to the fisheries extension and they can put you in touch with the person who keeps those lists. But we, we do have that. And uh, in the past, we've put them on our website. I'm just not sure if that if that's currently on it. We're in the process of transitioning websites. So uh, not sure what is still on there. Um, live bait rigs are best. I mean, live bait just always gives you 
a better opportunity to catch fish, not necessarily your target species, but throwing a night crawler out at a lake and letting it sit there, especially at this time of year, that shallow water, that's all it takes. Um, and you don't even have to use stuff that is made for walleye fishing. You know, Lindy rigs, but bottom bouncing rigs are typically seen as a walleye lure, a walleye bait setup. Um, but you can just get a bait holding hook, whatever you're comfortable with using for bait holding hooks, you know, make your own leader line, 10, 12 pound test, 14 pound test, um, tie it to a barrel swivel and put a casting sinker on it or put a egg weight sinker on it, you know, whatever you want to do to hold the bottom um, and just cast a night crawler out there, get a small enough hook where you can thread half the worm on it, allowing half of the worm to be off of it. Unlike fishing for pan fish that, you know, or that's too much. They're going to peck off your bait. You know, walleye, that worm's down there working around like this on the bottom, trying to crawl. It'll be up like that. And walleye just come and scoop it up. Um, and that's an effective way to catch them at this time of year. So you don't have to get fancy. You don't even have to, you know, really cast and retrieve. You can just throw out live bait. Um, if you're in really shallow water, you know, under six feet, you can use either a, a slip float, you know, slip cork bobber or a fixed bobber. And just make sure that you're getting your bait either on the bottom or within a couple of feet of the bottom, but a live minnow, leeches, night crawlers. Um, that's going to catch fish. That's going to catch walleye. It's going to catch sawgye, but it's also going to have good bycatch. So if you, you, maybe you set yourself up in an area where there are walleye and sawgye in that lake, they're just not happen to be in the area that you're fishing. You're putting yourself in the best opportunity with live bait to at least be actively, you know, getting bit or catching fish so it, in most instances if you're fishing blind if you're going somewhere you've never been before um or you're fishing a new part of the lake or you're just you know whatever it live bait is the way to go to start um if you're interested in just catching fish now if you're the type of person or the type of angler that hey i want to you know i want to learn how to catch them on artificial i want to i'm going to exhaust this i'm going to you know trial and error trial and error trial and error well, you know, try a few of these different baits, you know, try a curly tail grub or a, a paddle tail swim bait, you know, something long and slender on a eighth ounce quarter ounce jig head, work it around, you know, the area that you're fishing in, exhaust it for 15, 20, maybe even 30 minutes, um, especially if it's dark, you know, if you're, if you're trying to catch walleye and saw guy and it is dusk, if you're fishing for 15, 20 minutes and you're not getting bit, you're using artificials, move, like keep working down a dam or keep working down a point um, to try to find fish. If you're fishing with artificial, when you're fishing with live bait you can just let it sit there and, you know, whatever's swimming around, it may not be your target species, but more often than not, you get bit. So, but you don't have to do anything fancy for live bait. Just, However you like to rig them, just get it down in the bottom third of the water column and you're going to find fish. Uh, is there a lake close to Prague, Seminole area that is good fishing for walleye? Um, trying to think of what has, I mean, it's Prague, Prague may have sawgye in it already. Um, most of these smaller impoundments around central Oklahoma, we've, we've been putting sawgye in for a while. Uh, but over that direction, you know, uh, you fall, uh, um, but I would, if you're interested in that area, I'd give the Holdenville hatchery, just Google ODWC Holdenville and call Michael Hawley's the biologist over there. Um, and in that region, he's going to be able to tell you what lakes have mature walleye or sawgye that are worth catching. Um, so that, that would be my information for for the Prague area, if Prague, I, my guess is Prague probably has some saw guy that have been stocked in it. Um, Canton Lake, uh, Canton Lake is, I mean, if, uh, if I could, I would be spending the night at Canton tonight. Um, I would be fishing it hard for the next two weeks if I had the time and I will try to make a trip up there. Um, but tonight on the full moon with the North wind pounding into that bank, you're willing to put on some bibs and a jacket and weather a little bit of that chili. Um, I would imagine there is some pretty good success to be had this weekend on Canton Dam, uh, but definitely this week, next week, the following week. Um, and then again, you know, at the next full moon back in April, that's, those are the times you're looking for them to push up shallow. Uh, but yeah, Canton is a walleye lake. Uh, they, 
that's one of our premier walleye. You know, they have the, they've had the walleye rodeo going for decades. So there's some really nice fish in there. Um, but they do, they push up heavy on that dam. And if you get out there after dark, a lot of times you can just flash a spotlight, like a little mag light, run it along the bank and you'll just see eyes reflecting all the way down the dam. So you get, if you can walk down the dam after dark and flash a, a mag light and you see the eyes, you know, they're up in there thick because sometimes it's all the way down, you know, the dam. Um, anybody else have any questions? This is, this is one of our shorter asking anglers. There's just, you know, like I said, you can make walleye and sawguy fishing as complex or as simple as you want. Um, the most important part of all of it is looking for areas of rapid depth change. So typically your dam long uh, points that go up into feeder tributaries that are rocky, rocky shoals, gravel, outcropping that have easy access to deep water. Um, especially in the spring and the fall. Now, if you're trying to target walleye and sawgai in the post spawn months, the summer pattern, the winter, you are, you're looking for main lake points, stuff that you can't see that you either need depth line maps for or electronics. And then what you're looking for is big offshore humps. So is there maybe an old hillside that ran around the original river channel? So you get a big turn in the river channel with a main lake point, which is something you can't see it's underwater. Um, those are going to be areas to look to target the deep water in and around those spawning areas, especially if it, if it's a pretty rapid depth change, if you can go from four feet of water out to 40 feet of water and a few hundred yards, and there's a good, you know, defined breaks, either channel ledges, holes, humps, turns in the river channel. That's where you're looking for walleye to sit because again they want to be right down there on the bottom and they're looking up so they're usually facing into current or into the wind um, unless they're on the dam and then they're waiting for that rebound current to come back to them but they're constantly in motion you know they're turning and looking for food so uh but at this time of year uh, you can simple bait works um just a worm off of the bottom sitting there can be surprisingly you know, productive if you don't want to be casting and retrieving. But typically if it's that easy to catch them with a worm off the bottom, it's usually pretty easy to catch them with artificials. And then that's fun. You know, you cast and retrieve being active. Uh, I enjoy bait fishing occasionally sitting there in, in a lawn chair and just letting something soak. But for myself, I like to be active when I'm fishing. I like to be making casts or doing something. So, um, but yeah, if you're catching them on bait, just sitting there, there's a good chance that, any of the stuff we've shown today, if you can cast those out and retrieve them in, you're going to be getting bit as well. So uh, that's kind of all I got. If anybody's got any more questions, um, go ahead and put them in there. If you receive the email from me, you have my contact information, my cells down at the bottom. So you can call or text, send me an email, uh, any fishing questions you got. Um, I'm going to, I'm either going to directly help you or I'm going to send you to the person who has the most knowledge um, for a particular lake in their area. Um, can you attract walleye with lights? Uh, bait fish are attracted to lights, so that attracts predators. Um, you know, some guys will glow stick fish for crappie, so they'll drop the glow sticks down below the boat. All that's doing is attract, attracting bait fish, with the, which then attracts predators, so. At this time of year, you know, you're, you're, it's not necessary, um, you know, to bring in those bait fish. You're just, you're looking for pretty typical areas, the dam to start rip wrap lawn points, marinas, uh, inflowing tributaries and below the tailwaters. Um, that's what you're looking for. But, uh, as far as attracting walleye in, well, all predators are just attracted by bait. That's what's pulling them into an area current. You get current break. That's where bait flows in. Uh, you get wind, pushes all the bait fish somewhere, all those predators go and herd them in. So uh, open walleye are an open water fish. So a lot like sand bass, uh, hybrid stripers, um, they're usually on the move. You know, they're gonna they're gonna move throughout the day, sometimes substantial distances, uh, to get into preferred feeding zones. So uh, ledges, channel breaks, and riprap. Uh, at night is what you're looking for, but 
dawn to dusk is the best time to catch them. Doesn't mean that you can't catch fish in the middle of the day, especially in current. So in a tailwater, if you go down, you know, at like at Canton, you could fish the dam all night. And if they're running water, you know, once it's daylight, go down underneath the dam if they're running water and fish the stilling basin. Um, Cause you're, current especially in rivers and tailwaters that's just creating those fish have to be moving um so if they're expending calories to have to stay in that current then they have to constantly be eating when they're in still water uh, they get a lot more time to relax they can sit down in holes they can they can hold themselves and be comfortable so they're really looking for more where's the food coming in at which is typically going to be you know windblown sides especially on uh you know for fish like walleye and saw guy that are feeding on that bottom third, you know, that's where they're competing for food at. Where do they get the best opportunity to find food like that? Where there's current, you know, where wind is creating current, things are getting thrown discombobulated, easy meals for them to go get. Um, so holes and riprap is kind of what you're looking for. Uh, so the movement of bait fish, uh, you know, bait fish are depending on how big they are. I mean, and depending on what you consider bait fish, you know, to a bass or a flathead, a bluegill is a bait fish. Um, but for the most part, shad, minnows, smaller fish, fish under four inches in a lake. Again, they're going to be schooling fish. So bait fish are going to be found in schools. Uh, but those schools are very susceptible to wind and current. You know, they don't have the body mass to be able to, to withstand even a little bit of wind. So typically what ends up happening is you get bait and it's, completely you know on on clear bluebird days uh where there's no wind on the water you you can find bait balls all over that's typically why fishing on sunny like bluebird days where there's no wind is typically the di most difficult fishing uh because bait fish can spread out they can move they can swim and a lot of times predators just don't want to follow that um, they don't want to chase them all day they want to know where they're at so on windy days, cloudy days where there's chop, um, it forces bait fish into certain areas of the water column that predators know to target. That's when you get better active fishing days. It doesn't need to be blowing 40 miles an hour. It can be just a light five to 10 mile an hour breeze, just something to break up the water surface. Um, that's going to push bait fish onto windblown sides and then add other favorable habitat like ledges, points, riprap, uh, flooded timber, grass flats, anywhere where predators can hide, uh, you add all of those mixtures in and you're going to have a pretty good day of fishing, especially at this time of year. Um, but that's really what's affecting bait fish movement. They're just, they're kind of helpless when that water's flowing. They're just not big enough to be able to withstand that. So they end up going with the current. Um, and typically that blows them into a bank. And more often than not, it's a, it's an exposed bank. So it's going to be points that come out in into the main lake. So if the wind's blowing from the south and you have east-west facing points that come out, the south side of those points is where that wind's blowing in. So those fish are going to be positioning themselves either facing into the point, waiting for rebound current where it hits the you know, where the point's coming out, where the water can no longer get up over the top of it. It's sucking some of that water back underneath, creating kind of like a downward eddy. Then those, fa those fish are going to sit down at the bottom of the, um, you know, point perpendicular to it, looking up at the point, waiting for food to get sucked under. And some of the other fish are going to be positioned out onto the point where it's blowing over the top of them, over that ledge, and they're going to be situated that way. Or they're going to be right along the dam, either cruising parallel with it or sitting on it, waiting for the rebound current. But that's that's where your bait fish more often than not is getting pushed into. Predators know to look for that. So again, understanding the bottom composition of the lake on a dam, um, you know, pulling up a depth line map, looking at is there any unique feature to any part of the dam where maybe the main river channel comes in um, and then there's things that come off of that those are the places that you want to target first. It's just more habitat options for ambush predators um, as well as where bait fish are going to get sucked into. So uh, that's, that's what you're looking for as far as movement of bait fish. It's just easier to identify those areas uh, when the wind's blowing because you know that that's where they're going to be. When it's calm, 
bait fish can be anywhere. Uh, they're typically deeper in the water column, just like any fish. Doesn't matter the size of the fish. They do not like to be up in the top third of the water column when the water's glass because they know, you know, it's ingrained in them to be fearful of avian predators as well. So they know that danger comes from above. So typically when they get up on top of the water, you get the chop going. So they have light refraction that protects them from avian predators, but it, underwater predators, your fish are going to push them up into the top and then they're going to use some type of corral. So if that's a bank or a point, then that's even better. So that's, that's bait fish movement in a nutshell. But I mean, you could, you can get super technical and in depth with, with subject matter like that, but that, you know, just basic, that's what you're looking for. Points, points and riprap dams, whatever could stop wind and, you know, whatever is out into where that wind is, which is typically going to be on a north wind day or a south wind day. Um, and then, you know, we're looking for warmer water temperatures for all species. You know, walleye are a little bit more cold resistant. Uh, they're a northern fish. So they they spawn. Typically, they're spawning up in the north country in late April, early May. Whenever they get ice out, they're spawning right after ice out. So you think about that, the water's frozen and it ices out and then they're immediately spawning. So they're spawning in water temps, 42, 44 degrees. Um, I think in Oklahoma, they favor a little bit warmer water um, to spawn, but 44 to 48 degrees is, is a happy medium, but you're going to have fish spawning from 40 degrees all the way up into the low 50s. Just depends on the fish, the body of water, spawning habitat. There's lots of different factors that play into it, but um, here for the next six weeks, I mean, pretty much every species of fish outside of, you know, even channel cats start to get in on the action as we get later into middle of April, later April, they'll start pushing up to gorge in similar areas. But at this time of year, going anywhere, you're just looking, you're looking for points, especially rocky points, points that have access out to deep water that are getting wind driven one way or another, whether it's a North wind or a South wind, it's a point that's constantly catching bait fish. That's always going to have predators nearby. The dam obviously is going to hold fish year round, but this is a time of year where a lot of spawning species are going to utilize the dam to spawn. So it congregates fish, the mouths of creeks and rivers. So if you have any inflowing water, uh, you're looking for those as well. Um, so the mouths moving up, if you can get a boat up or there's bank access uh, for walleye and saw guy, you're really targeting kind of those first couple of riffle runs that come in. You don't really need to go too far upstream to, to pick them off as they're going up or downstream, um, like a school of white bass that's going to keep moving up as far as they can go until they find adequate spawning habitat. So, but that's really what you need to look for to key in um, mouths of rivers points and riprap on dam and below the tailwater um, if they're running water or if it's the type of area that maybe has like a sluice gate or something where there's always a little bit of current going because in some cases those tailwaters fish better um, without a torrent of water coming out which will happen at many places here in the next couple of months as we get our spring flooding rains that come in um, so that's uh that's what i got for it so Again, anybody's got any other questions, now's the time to ask them. Otherwise, uh, don't don't hesitate to reach out. That's what I'm here for. Um, and if it's on the weekend, again, call, text. Text on the weekend. I'll, I'll usually get back to you because I'm usually out fishing too. So um, we, want, we want you guys to have success uh, catching fish. We want you to learn some stuff. So, you know, kind of you become the teacher eventually because the biggest thing with this is um, you guys as the anglers, as the public, the reason that we're even able to have fisheries and hunts, hunteries in North America is because of public access to be able to go. Um, and that requires participation. So taking a kid fishing, taking a family member, a friend from work who maybe has never gone. If you're an experienced angler, or you just, you know, you want, you want somebody to talk to, you need, you know, want some company this is the time of year to introduce somebody to the sport because more often than not, you're going to find success with some type of fish species, no matter where you go. Um, if you're on more of the beginning end of your journey into fishing, make it basic, 
hooks, weights, bobbers, and live bait. Worms, minnows, you know, you can go to a bait store, get a bucket of minnows. You can go to Walmart bait store, get a cup of cup of night crawlers and fishing around rip wrap points. You don't have to cast out very far. You can fish it below a bobber, fish it right off the bottom. Um, but you're going to have a lot of success at this time of year. And it's an exciting time of year because it's, it is the one opportunity that from the bank, it's a 50, 50 coin flip on catching some really quality fish. I mean, fish that are in that above average size for whatever species it is. Um, this is when you get into them is late March, early April, mid April, as you get into the Northern part of the state that might not start until April and it might run all the way into, uh, early May, but this weekend into next week, the Southern part of the state, anything South of I-40 and East of I-35, um, it's, it's on, I mean, it's, it is time to fish right now. Uh, you're going to see spotty reports from the central part of the state and the northern part of the state. But warm days, uh, paying attention to the overnight lows. Highs are not as important at this time of year. It's the overnight lows. Um, that's really what's going to affect how, what your temperature is in the water, how fast it's dropping. Because sunlight on the water is going to warm up the shallows. And if it's turbid water where it's dirty, it's going to hold on to that heat in that dirty water. So it can warm up, you know, two, three, four, five degrees in an afternoon, but can it hold on to that temperature? Because that's really what turns the fish on to, okay, it's time to spawn. Um, Cause there's viability issues with, you know, their eggs and, and spawning. They need, they need water temperatures that are at the right deal to incubate and everything like that. So they're very, fish are very aware at this time of year of rising water, falling water and water temperatures. So the first kind of days that we see where lows are preferably above 50, but right around 50 degrees, doesn't matter what the daytime highs are. The second you get a few days in a row of right around 50 for the overnight lows, you can guarantee that up in the shallows, no matter what the weather is, there are going to be a lot of fish that are very active, either in their spawn, gorging in pre-spawn or gorging in post-spawn. Because um, typical species, you get about one to three weeks before they spawn and then another week or two after they spawn where they are just actively feeding um, and that they're super aggressive and they're looking for bait in shallow water because everything is kind of spawning at this time of year. Um, lakes that get a shad spawn, uh, that kind of takes place later into April. Um, but again, that next full moon in April, you're going to see walleye and sawgye and all your other predators push up looking for shad spawning, even though they've completed their spawn cycle. Um, so that's something to pay attention to as well. But um, it's that time of year. It's exciting. Um, you always, you know, we hope that this is the last little bout with winter that we get today. The extended forecast looks good. Um, outside of that, we're getting into April. So I would hope that we don't have any more violent northern fronts that come through so we had a pretty mild winter um water levels are a little low but we got great rain coming uh we got some good rain last night we're gonna get some really good rain monday tuesday wednesday of next week throughout most of the state so if you're looking if you're a white bass angler a walleye or sawgye angler in the southern part of the state those creeks and rivers that are flowing in you know to all different bodies of water texoma hugo Pine Creek, McGee Creek, uh, Broken Bow, uh, those those are going to be on next week. We're getting the water. The temperatures are there. You're really going to see peak activity start to take place next week down there, um, if it hasn't already started. Uh, the little bit of rain we got last night, tomorrow, you know, Saturday, if you live southern Oklahoma, I'd go check out Pennington Creek and Tishomingo, um, the Mountain Fork for sure at the Narrows and uh, any bank access that you can get just right above the northern end of Broken Bow. Those are going to be two real good fisheries probably this weekend and all into next week. Um, and then we get the good rains and a couple of days of some southerly winds. You're going to see fishing really start to turn on here in the central part of the state and the, the northern part of the state. Um, but it's kind of all I got. I don't see any more questions. So we'll go ahead and hang this thing up a few minutes early. Um, appreciate everybody for coming out um, or logging on. Uh, 
You can check out all of our videos at wildlifedepartment.com in the Ask an Angler section in our fishing resources. Um, and like I said, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm here to help. Uh, love talking fishing. So until next time, thank you all for coming. Uh, we got a lot more of these coming up here in the next few weeks. The next one is on, uh, next one is next Friday for paddlefish. So uh, if you've ever never gone snagging before and you want to learn something about snagging, we're going to be doing paddlefish next week. Got largemouth bass and pond fishing coming up in April. And then we have catfish, sunfish, non-game fish, and river bass fishing, river creek, clear water bass fishing in May. So check out our events page at gooutdoorsoklahoma.com. We always have our fishing events listed up there. They're always going to be free to the public. Um, we also have a lot of in-person fishing clinics coming up. So uh, check out Go Outdoors on the events page for all of our upcoming fishing events that we got going on. Outside of that, take care. Everybody have a great weekend. Be safe out there. Hope everybody's hooking up on fish. If you do happen to get into some fish, please share them with us. Go to wildlifedepartment.com. Upload your catch uh, in our fishing tab at the dock. We love showcasing your fish, and it's a great way for our biologists to check out what's being caught in the region and, and see all the happy faces of anglers. So take care, everybody. Thank you for showing up. And until next time, tight lines.